Please welcome together with me our first keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Marco Rickmann. <laughs> Professor Rickmann, you have been studying, working, teaching for more than 20 years in various functions on the topic of sustainability. You are a professor of higher education development at the University of Vechta in uh, Germany. And if I'm not mistaken, you just came back for a, from a conference, the, this year's European Conference on Educational Research. We are delighted to have you here in Bern with us. And before I give you the floor, um, there is the next slide again with a QR code. So at the end of the keynote speech, you will be able to um, yeah, send us your comments, your questions to Professor Rickmann. They will be gathered and moderated on the tool, and then they will be submitted to the two of us at the end of your presentation here on stage. So take a picture, and then we start with the first keynote. A warm welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for having me. Good morning, bonjour, buenos dias, uh, good morning. Uh, it's great uh, to be here uh, at that conference. Um, and yeah, I, I have been asked to, to share some ideas with you about education for sustainable development. And then I was wondering, well, probably all of you know a lot, perhaps some of you more than me about it. So the question is a little bit, what can I tell you? But I will try to, to do some reflections that hopefully are interesting, at least for, for some of you, or perhaps most. Um, and I will start with uh, some reflections on the concept of education for sustainable development. Then we'll focus also especially on the idea of ESD competency. So the question, what do lecturers need? And if you had uh, read the survey some minutes ago, there you could see one of the answers was a main barrier may be the lack of competencies uh, of pedagogical methods uh, among the lect lecturers. And that's indeed one of my ideas, that that is one of the main problems, and I will speak uh, about that. And uh, then I will also make the link to uh, transfer and, and uh, service learning as an example of how a transfer can take place. So, first, education for sustainable development. Um, I think very interesting here is, and we discussed it yesterday at a conference in Marburg, is education for sustainable development still a, a topic, a field that schools and higher education institutions have to deal with? Or is it the core, or should it be the core of education nowadays? And I, with Wolfgang Klafki, would say that education in general, at every higher education institution school, somehow should be education for sustainable development. If we call it like that or not, doesn't matter so much, but I would argue that really education has to be about empowerment, about uh, dealing with the societal questions of today, and that is what Wolfgang Klafki said in his theory of general education, and I think we can use a lot of what he was saying about what education is meant to be also for implementing education for sustainable development. And um, yeah. some of you, uh, in, the, in the welcome address, I think both of you somehow were making a reference also to the idea of, of competencies, of empowering, enabling people. And, um, and yeah, the, the term transformation competence was mentioned. And I think that is something that we can find in many publications. That is one more or less up-to-date publication that I wanted to show you a picture from, from an up-to-date publication. Perhaps some of you know it already. Uh, it's the sustainability competencies that first were developed by, by Avik uh, and others from Arizona State University. And now, two days ago, uh, two years ago, there was a Delphi a study uh, about reconfirming the, the different competencies. And that is what you can see in this picture. And basically, the idea here is that we can say it is a lot about complexity, about system thinking. And that is 
what students, but, uh, and I think you in the uh, first welcome address were saying that it is also about educating people so that in the future they will do something different. I would fully agree, but I think it's also about now and about the adults. So somehow, and that was also something we discussed yesterday at another conference, how can we also reach the nowadays decision makers? Why education? But I will also come back later to an issue that is perhaps not only via education, but also them somehow should improve their system thinking, for example. But then it's also about the future, and I think that was mentioned also already. It is about crafting ideas for the future, inventing the future, understanding that the future is millions of futures that are possible and that it depends on us which of these futures will become true. And then it's about values here in the middle, mapping, negotiating values. Because obviously, it's not like there's one answer what sustainability may be nowadays and how a sustainable future could look like. There are many possible ideas, and so we need to think about values for, for really finding out. And there, I, I think I don't agree that it is only about science. I think it's a lot about moral and about values, because there's not one answer how we can deal with climate change, for example. We have the scientific evidence, yes, but then it's about our values, about moral decisions, what we do with this um, scientific basis. And that is what, where value thinking comes into play. And then younger or older people who want to take a decision, who want to act, uh, need obviously to perhaps to join with others, join forces, their strategic competence and interpersonal competence plays a big role. And then in the end, it's about implementing, acting. And I think what is really important, and this has been added a little bit more recently to that competence idea, is what you can see there in the upper right side, intrapersonal competence. Because it's a lot also about our, and the inner development has been mentioned already, it's a lot about our emotions, our fears, our hopes, frustrations. Many young people become depressed, or older people also become depressed, become frustrated. And there is really what, that we need also this capacity or, or competence to deal with those kind of positive, but also very often negative emotions. I mentioned already the values, and that is something that has been during the last years, for the last years, often discussed with the term also transformative learning, transformative education. And I think there are some main values that are so general, so basic, like conservation of nature, human dignity, justice, that really the idea of ESD is to transmit somehow, to socialize, to educate people to live in line with those values. But on the other hand, it's about more specific questions, like do we eat meat? or we don't eat meat, and all the questions that I mentioned already also related to climate change, what way exactly do we take? And there is, there is not so much about transmitting specific ideas, there it's more about negotiating, clarifying, to reflect on your own values, but also yeah, to get to know the values of other people and, and to take a stand on societal values or the values of other people and really to, to learn and to broaden also your own horizon. For example, living in Europe, I think it should be a lot also about learning from other continents, learning from values in, in Latin America, for example, for example, the good living discourse when we were in, in Ecuador, Bolivia, for example. And so in the end, these transformative learning processes, bringing people into spaces, into settings where they can reflect on their values, then may lead to conceptual change. It will not always happen, but sometimes, after a longer time, it may lead to conceptual change, meaning that the attitudes, the values, perhaps even the world beliefs of, of that person may have been questioned, may have changed somehow. And what I think is really important, uh, and, and that is where I wanted to, to uh, yeah, put on the table a little bit the question, what is really the role of education here? Because I think very important it is to see that education is not the main responsible area. And that's perhaps difficult to say here, because we are in a, co in a conference on education. But I really believe that we should not put too much pressure or responsibility on education, because the main responsibility is in economy, is in the economic system, is in the, um, is in, in the political system. And obviously, as educators, as higher education institutions, we can contribute, 
but I think we no never should uh, take the responsibility when the politicians, for example, say, ah, but you have first to educate the people. No, you have first to act, and parallelly we can educate people, but we won't wait and we cannot wait for politicians uh, to, to, to wait for our, for our actions. They could act today. Uh, enterprises could change today, and many of them do, but those that still don't, uh, we shouldn't t see it as our responsibility to make them change. But what we can do, obviously, we cannot open up spaces only for, for learning on, on consumption, and that often is the focus of ESD, thinking about fair trade, about organic agriculture, about uh, consumption decisions, and that is important. But I think also very important is to make, create spaces for citizenship education, political education, so that young people who perhaps are active already may even learn more about how they can act, where they can act, how they can be and become an uh, active citizen. And also especially the young people who perhaps who are not motivated yet also can learn something about what they can do, how they can influence society. And I mean, we as educators don't have to tell them, go to a protest, uh, start the revolution, but at least we can empower them that they learn how they may influence the structures. And I think that is here really my, my main point. Sustainable development will not take place without changing fundamentally the structures of our economy and our society. And so the question here is, what can ESD about it? Obviously not indoctrinate young people, but open up spaces in which um, they can be empowered and can learn something about critical political agency. Um, and yeah, also, um, and that is why I think ESD really has to be political. Not political in the sense of, of promoting one political party or something, what has been a discussion in Germany sometimes, especially with the right-wing alternative for Germany, them criticizing schools that they are too green, that they are promoting too much the ideas of the Green Party. And well, <laughs> they may promote the idea that climate change is taking place and that for some politicians is already too much because they think, no, that's indoctrination. I would agree with you, that is just uh, sharing ideas of science. And so it's obviously okay to, to talk about climate change, to show the, the problems of climate change. But I would add, it's also okay to discuss about political issues, to promote a political dialogue. And so it's not only about addressing individual consumption-related issues, but also structural issues. And I think, and I don't know, too much about uh, what exactly is taking place, for example, in Swiss schools. But I would say in German schools and German universities, there's really a lack of spaces for political reflection, political discourse, uh, for questioning the structures of our society or even the world society. And so in the end, it's about, as also Arjen Wals from the Netherlands says, it's about creating sustainability citizens who are really able to act, uh, to, to reflect, and to be perhaps even disruptive, as uh, some say, for example, Leila Lotze-Sitka from South Africa, she speaks about ESD to be disruptive, really to question the fundaments of our society. Well, what does that mean for lecturers? Obviously, many of us are motivated, and we are more or less competent, but I said already in some minutes ago, perhaps we are not enough competent, really, to, to implement ESD. And I would say, first, what we need is the sustainability competencies that I showed. And I think many of us probably are already somehow good in system thinking. That's perhaps also why we are here. Uh, we think about the future, etc. But besides that, developing the sustainability competencies, we also need ESD competencies. And I think that's quite obvious, because for every field, that is true. Somebody that is a good musician not necessarily is a good music teacher. And that's exactly the same for ESD. Somebody who is a sustainability activist or is really good in sustainability not necessarily is a good ESD teacher. And so therefore, we really have to think about what are pedagogical competencies that educators and teachers need uh, for, for implementing ESD. There have been published many approaches during the last 10, 20 years. Interestingly, 
For many years, we only discussed about the sustainability competencies that students should develop. And then a little bit later, we, and especially more recently, there have been a lot of discourse on the question what teachers should know or should be able to do. In an international project and also partners from Switzerland, but uh, led by Paul Ware from uh, the UK, in a European project, we also reflected on that questions and we created a, net, a, a framework called the Rounded Sense of Purpose, RSP, Framework for ESD Competencies. This framework also describes that idea of that, that educators should have a critical understanding of sustainable development and ESD. Uh, and it also yeah, explains and describes this idea of, of pedagogical competencies. That probably is too small to read it from the last uh, rows, but that's not a problem because I just want to present the, the general idea and not the details of that framework. The general idea is that there are 12 competencies that are very similar to, to the sustainability competencies that I just presented, or some of you may know the concept of Gestaltungskompetenz uh, developed by Gerhard de Hahn and others from uh, Freie Universität Berlin in Germany. So it's not different competencies, it may be named a little bit different, but in the end it's the same competencies. But what is different here, that it is more about what the teachers should do. If you are interested in, uh, you may now take a photo of the, of the link, or I will also share the presentation and you may receive it later. And then perhaps visit that website, it's available in, in German and French and Spanish and in some other, English obviously, and some other languages like I, th I think also Dutch and Catalan, for example. So um, if you are interested in the ideas of these ESD competencies, and there's also a lot of information what activities can be used in the different competence fields. And I just give one example that you see how the framework works. Uh, and I take the example of the futures competence. Um, yeah, like that. The future competence for each competence field, you find a short list of some elements what students should develop. You can see here that it is about envisioning different futures, learning about possible, probable futures, uh, recognizing also relations between the past, the present, and the future. And so that is something, for example, you would like students to learn, to develop. But then, as I said, the question is, what about the teacher? And here again, you see, and it's not necessarily a complete list. It's just some suggestions, what teachers may think about, some methods that teachers may uh, develop or may learn. And for example, you can see here in the first uh, row, future studies techniques. Somehow educators, if they want their students to learn about the future, the educators themselves should be able to work with future study techniques like scenario development, backcasting, and not necessarily all teachers have to develop all the competencies in the same way. I mean, we all know it may be teamwork. In a school, in a university, there are many different educators and teachers, and some of them perhaps are, are really good in future thinking and know a lot about scenario development or other future methods. Others may be better in project work. So obviously it's not that all of them have to be perfect ESD educators, but in a team, uh, somehow these uh, areas should be reflected so that also the methods are there for, for developing um, really a good, good ESD. Well, now to come for uh, la some last minute to the idea of transfer, I, I just want to um, say that in my opinion, really transfer is as important as education, as research, as part of the whole institution approach. Um, there has been a more or less recent definition of Benjamin Nölting and others in an international publication what sustainability transfer might, may be. Uh, they say here that it is a specific form of uh, transfer, namely those practitioner university partnerships that contribute to or strive for sustainable development in society. So the main core here is really how can universities and practitioners work together in research-oriented fields. We often call that transdisciplinarity, but I think sustainability transfer is broader because it's not only about research, it's also about practical cooperation of, of practitioners and universities. And uh, for coming to an end almost, I just would like to share some ideas about service learning. Um, as a practical example, and I've seen, I think there will be also a workshop on service learning in the afternoon. 
Um, service learning is the combination of service, obviously, and learning, how the name shows already. It's a process in which students offer a service for somebody, for a community partner or somebody else, and learn in that process something, for example, about sustainability. So service learning may enable active, relevant, and collaborative learning processes. And we can see, for example, in Germany that since the 2000s, there has been an increasing interest of universities in service learning. And in the literature, we also can find some statements that service learning indeed is a really good method of ESD. I don't want to go into all details here so that I still have uh, a minute left, perhaps, for uh, our recent project. At the moment, in a project called Senatra, we are implementing service learning and we are doing research. Our question here is, to what extent can the implementation of service learning in higher education contribute to a comprehensive institutional sustainable transformation of universities? I want, don't want to name all universities, but you can see that there are different universities from Germany and the student-led Netzwerk N, which is a student association uh, working with sustainability. And in that project, we are implementing service learning at the different universities mentioned there, and we are doing research. What do the students learn? What is the impact on the societal partners? And we do service learning on campus from creating projects on campus, but we also do service learning with partners from outside the university to, to become active in the, uh, in, in the region. At the moment, we are running that course at the University of Fechter, and because I don't have so much time anymore, I just would like to tell you that it is an interdisciplinary course where we work with students from different areas, and I just show you the list of the different partners with, uh, with them, we work there, so it's different NGOs and partners from the region. And the expected learning outcomes is that the students develop knowledge about sustainability and different sustainability in different fields, but also may develop sustainability competencies and um, sustainability related values. And the idea is also to have some impact in the region on the society. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this inspiring speech, for the, your clear statements, but also the concrete examples. Um, as already announced, we, we have now a few minutes time to, to have some questions from you. Um, I'll be reading them from here and, and discussing with you. Should your question not be answered or asked, um, I'm sure you can approach Mr. Rickman during a break and, and continue uh, the discussion. The same applies for all our guests. Yeah, we have a first question in this. Can you give the outline of a sustainable st sustainability class? What exact, exactly do you teach? Thank you very much, and that gives me a minute more for <laughs> explaining uh, that course. And perhaps I can just, uh, because there was really fast, let me see where I go. Yeah, perhaps here. What we do in that course is that we have in that course, for example, at the moment, more or less 20 students from different areas, teacher education, social work, geography, different areas. And the uh, students come into the class, and we have one or two or three weeks where we bring them together, talk about sustainability, because some of them are bachelor students, some are master students. They all come from different fields. So it's really a very heterogeneous group. So first, we need some time to have them on the more or less same level. Therefore, we talk a little bit about different theories of sustainability, etc. And then the practitioners come to the classroom, the ones that I showed briefly, and they present their cases, their problems. And then the students can form groups, and then in a more or less 10, 8 to 10 week process, they uh, yeah, try to develop solutions to the practitioner's problems, implement the projects, and then we have a presentation at the end, a report, where they really present their ideas. So that, in a nutshell, would be an example of one of my courses. Obviously, they are different. I also teach more theoretical courses on ESD, but that would be a, really a practice-oriented, competence-based course where students really can try out, uh, can explore sustainability, and, and hopefully that is what we will try to find out in our research project, really develop in a good way also sustainability competencies. Thank you. 
We have a next question. I'll read it in German. And just as a side note, you can ask your questions in French, in German, in English. We're all fine with that. So the next question is, wie bringen wir die Hochschulen näher zu den Lebenswelten? Wie kann die Kluft unterschiedlicher Lebensvorstellungen verkleinert werden? Hat die Hochschulbildung hier Möglichkeiten? Wow, first in my mind, I've translated into English to, to give a good answer. Well, so I would say it's about the gap, right? About the gap between the university and practical life, perhaps, but also the gap between different ways of living, different understanding of what the life is about. Well, I think somehow I gave a short answer already to, uh, to that question, talking about transformative education. I think the idea here really can be to open up settings in which dialogue can take place. Dialogue between also practitioners, external persons and members of the university. That is what I talked about now with service learning. But also dialogue between um, yeah, for example, different students. And I mean, in our university, although I said it's a quite heterogeneous group disciplinary-wise, but still not so heterogeneous because we don't have a law school, we don't have an engineering school. So our, our students are more or less from social sciences, teacher education. So it's not so diverse, but I think especially in universities where you have management, economics, law, um, engineering, there may be a big differences between what the students think and how they live. And I think there's really, really where we need such kind of interdisciplinary courses where they can meet, where they leave their ivory tower of their school, their, their discipline, and can meet and can um, discuss and can also be challenged. I think that is what constructivism tells us, that learning is also mainly about challenging people, about disturbing their daily routines and their da daily thinking. And I think that is really what a university can do without, as I said before, indoctrinating, but really open up spaces where they can reflect, can exchange, can negotiate also. Yeah, maybe just to, to deepen that a little bit, we, we have two other questions in... First one, how to enable and empower our teachers to take the courage to be political while facing ESD? That concerns your clear call on citizenship education. And the second question that is linked to that or that fits well is, um, well, political systems and decision makers, they start to stop political discourse or to create this uh, space in schools and cultural institutions. And how can we react to this I, 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 make, uh, I, I take the question, these anti-democratic tendencies when we should, on the opposite, address structural constraints in the educational programs. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yes, indeed, and there is a recent survey from Germany, a survey with, I, if I remember correctly, teacher students, and I think also young in-service teachers. And the result of that study is that most of them think they have to be neutral when implementing ESD. They think they cannot talk about policy, about politics. And I think that is really a problem. And the question is, where does that come from? It, one reason may be what in the second part of the question was said. It may be because there has been some criticism of specific groups, especially neo-fascist, right-wing, anti-democratic groups, telling that schools shouldn't be political, why they are very political and want to change schools at all. But I think that'd be my one reason why uh, young teachers and teacher students are somehow afraid. Another reason may be that they are not used to it. I mean, in a university where they never talk about politics, but only about science, etc., I think they perhaps also not know how to do it. And I think that is really why we need more political reflection, more citizenship education, even and especially in programs like engineering, for example, I think it should be a core issue of engineering courses, or not of all courses, obviously, but of an engineering program, it should be a core issue that there's also political education, citizen education. And I think also in teacher education, and then I don't know how they can take the courage or can be motivated, but I, I would always argue if they know more about how it can look like and about the differences between being political and indoctrinating, because it's not the same, obviously. You can be political, and I always tell my students what I think, what I do, that I don't have a car, for example, and that I am in favor of, 
of how do we say in English car free cities <laughs> so for example living in Bremen I always would argue I would like to take all of the cars out of the city and I don't have to problem to tell students that but obviously if somebody disagrees then I cannot say, oh, that's a wrong answer, <laughs> or you have to leave the course. I mean, it really has <laughs> to be about uh, accepting different, uh, different ideas and, and worldviews, and, and then also this kind of political uh, competence, I think, can be developed. So we have a total of 33 questions, so I'm really amazed how active you are, and it's very, yeah, very nice to see that you're all here with us. Uh, we have time for one more and last question, and it is... What do you think about the inner development goals? Is it the right framework for all universities to adopt, to align all different competences frameworks out there? Um, I, haven't, uh, I haven't done research on the inner development goals. They are not even really part of my daily uh, work, let's say, but obviously uh, I have heard uh, about these discourses and I have been working with the PhD students. She, uh, she is doing research on the role of emotions in ESD. And I know that recently, and that may be of interest for some of you at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, recently they have been created the position of a professor of sustainability and in the inner developments. He is called Pascal Frank. So if you are interested in that, that area, you may have a look at the work of Pascal Frank, who, who will now do research on uh, the SDGs and inner development goals at uh, Wageningen University. Uh, I think it's a very important field. I said already when I talked about the competencies that frustrations, hope, emo emotions in general is really important. So, and, and mindfulness somehow is also related to that issue. It's not my, my, uh, my main field, and I have learned a lot now with my PhD student. Uh, we co-taught some uh, courses, or one course especially, and I learned a lot from her how to deal with emotions in university activities, because I think that is, for example, an area where I'm not used to. Mm -hmm. I have been socialized in, in classes at higher in, in higher education where it was not normal to ask, for example, okay, how do you feel now? My teachers never asked me, how do I feel? And so I'm not really used to that. Uh, and so I'm very happy that there are people who are perhaps more used to it, know more methods, are more competent, and I hope to learn from them much more. But I think it's a really important field. Thank you very much. Thank you, warm welcome. And I feel very inspired by all your insights and contributions. Thank you. Thank you.